I'm Neil Chaffick. I'm the director of the Carnegie Center for Literacy and Learning here in Lexington. And we consider Lexington to be the literary arts capital of our region, and Kentucky to be a state that is deeply steeped in literature. Tonight, we're going to be having our first ceremony, our first induction ceremony for the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame. And the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame is brand new, one of the only a few Writers Hall of, Halls of Fame in the country. And we are doing it because we hope to honor 200 years of writers who have been in our state and also to encourage and support uh, current writers, of which we have a very large and growing pool. The purpose of the, of the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame is first to honor 200 years of great writing in our state. And the second uh, main purpose of it, and I think even a greater purpose, is to encourage people who are writing right now or who have yet to begin writing to consider that as an art form. We often think of visual art and music and film as art forms, but we don't often think about writing in the same way. But writing undergirds all those other types of art forms, and so we wanted to bring that up and bring that out, and also just showcase the tremendous talent that we have here in the state. Yeah, the process that we used started with the public nominations, and we had about 75 people from around the state get back to us. We sent out the word throughout the writing community and the general community, and from those 75 people, we got about 200 nominees. That was gradually filtered and um, eventually uh, brought down to about 13 finalists. Those are the finalists that we have announced publicly, but we're not telling who the six winners are. And we're doing that just for fun, let people uh, think about the 13 and see what they think of those writers. We've gotten feedback that we missed a writer here or a writer there that should have been in that 13, but we feel like that's a, a good conversation to have if you're talking about writers and writing and authors and books. That's our mission as the Carnegie Center, so we're very happy to do that. Uh, so tonight we will be announcing the six inductees, and we will be officially inducting them into the Hall of Fame. And the, the purpose tonight, we also feel like there's always a story being told, and to some extent, these writers themselves, who they are and what they wrote about, tell the story of Kentucky since its incarnation. We will be inducting a new group every year. This year we made it only deceased writers, only people who are dead. And we did that because we wanted to particularly honor those who are at the foundation of our history uh, in writing. In future years, we expect to add some of those other foundational writers, but also begin to add living writers as they are producing even today. And there are so many that um, that's going to be one of the hardest things to do, and we hope we don't hurt people's feelings doing that. Um, but it's always one of those things where, as you try to lift people up, um, you know, others we hope will be inspired by those um, who have been lifted up and decide to go out and write some great books themselves. About the hall, one of the other things that we are looking for down the road is to establish an actual space for us to have a Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame. And maybe more than that, you know, the types of things that we've, you know, that almost like a, I don't want to say museum because that sounds like it's going to be old, boring stuff, but a place where the writers are honored and the whole history of publishing and how that's changed. So we might have, you know, the first printers and then printers uh, that we used 100 years ago and then on to typewriters and eventually to the computer and the kind of printer where you just push print and it all happens in a, in a moment. So we want, we, we hope that actually children, um, that we can reach out to the schools and encourage kids, you know, teachers to bring their kids here so that they can see the faces of the writers, they can see the actual books that they 
wrote maybe the first edition, the signed copies of those kind of books, see how they wrote those books and what they wrote about, and learn about writing and writers in the hopes that maybe someday they would want to be on that wall as well. Can you hear well back there? Yes. All right. Welcome. Good evening. If there is anybody uh, who's got a seat next to them now, we're going to give up the seats that we reserve for people. There's one back there. So if anybody, a couple over here, feel free to move off the back wall and find a place that's comfortable. Again, good evening and welcome to the first induction ceremony for the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame. My name is Neil Chethick and I'm the director of the Carnegie Center. A couple of years ago, we here at the center declared Kentucky the, liber li the literary arts capital, <laughs> slips off the tongue there, the literary arts capital of mid-America. And in the last two years, we have been doing whatever we can to establish that and make that as concrete a reality as it truly is. We did it for a couple of reasons. One was to honor the 200 year history of great writers in this state. And the other was to encourage the new and growing pool of writers, uh, of contemporary writers who are working in our state. And tonight, we're moving both of those goals forward. We're honoring the past by inducting the first six uh, members into the Hall of Fame. And we're also going to showcase our contemporary authors, uh, six of whom are here tonight. They have agreed to read excerpts from the work of these newly minted Hall of Famers. So we get the, the um, pleasure of hearing the words of those who have written in the past through the voices and the choices of these men and women who are currently writing. We get to see who they and what pieces of writing they think are the most wondrous that came out of each individual writer. Now inside your program on the inside right hand side you'll find an explanation of how the first Hall of Fame class was selected and how and who all um, participated in that selection process. There were more than a hundred people involved at one point or another but if you have any complaints, I'm the one to talk to. Um, I'll do my best to defend any of these choices, but I also recognize that um, if you love a particular writer, no matter what I say, it's not gonna change your mind. Um, and so these were choices that were kind of a uh, consensus of many different sources. And remember, there's always next year. This year, all the inductees um, had to meet one threshold before we even considered the quality and the impact of their work. And that one threshold was that they had to be dead. <laughs> Deceased, no longer with us. No easy way to say this, no longer breathing, maybe is the right way. Our intention this first year was to celebrate those who had created the foundation for the literary world that we are in here in Kentucky. And in the future, we do intend to open the Hall of Fame to living writers as well. Now, before we launch into the names, and you'll see the faces of the six inductees, I'd like to introduce a man who has supported the Carnegie Center and our push to establish Kentucky as a literary arts capital since he first heard about it. I could see the excitement on his face when we first uh, spoke about it. And he's someone who really gets it that art and education are integral to a first-class city. Please welcome Lexington Mayor Jim Gray. Wow. Well, it is just, it is so exciting to be here, and I have to confess, I, I, every time I get to come to the Carnegie Center and walk all 20 steps, as John and Carolyn Hackworth, my neighbors across the street, we know that it's exciting to be here because what's going on here, and Neil, you nailed it. You said it so perfectly. I remember when he described this aspirational, audacious thinking, the description, 
of the Carnegie Center is becoming, and Lexington, becoming the literary capital of mid-America. You know, isn't that yes? And, and, and it's so exciting that, that, that you know, from a, from a point of view of, of not just imagining it, but actually taking the steps like tonight to celebrate this extraordinary history in Kentucky, Kentucky writers. You know, some, Neil, Neil described 200, 200 years, and as Vice Mayor Gordon knows, I, I routinely just drop into a description of Lexington and our rich, authentic history reaching back 238 years to 1775, one year before the Declaration itself was signed. And all along that path, those of you embedded in this literary tradition know that the tapestry of this tradition is just completely woven by those who have expressed our history and the emotions <clears throat> so well through literary forms. Uh, I'm going to tell one quick story that I think, for me at least, illustrates so much of the attachment that we have to place. And it's reflected so extraordinarily through language. It was about 10 years ago, and I was right here with Frank Walker and Crystal Wilkinson. And we decided to take a journey all the way across town to Natasha's. <laughs> and it was a wonderful walk that I'll always remember because, you know, here are two writers gifted with expression you know, and talent. And, uh, and so I would write between them, I feel, I feel like. That's my memory in my mind's eye anyway. And, and so the two of them were describing this place and what it meant to them then. And I've described this, I've told this story a bunch of times. And Frank said, wherever I go, my touchstone is always Lexington. It's my center of gravity. And he talked about going to Indiana, and then to Alabama, and to northern Kentucky, and to eastern, and to other places. And of course, he's back here now. <laughs> but it was so confirming, I guess, is the best way to describe it, for those of us who don't necessarily have those gifts, but to know that we're close by those who do. And that through a place like this, we celebrate this extraordinary history of not just Southern writing, as Frank said, but Kentucky writing. So welcome to each and every one of you who are here tonight to celebrate this and those and thank you for all you do for Lexington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And the mayor has another group to go and visit here in a few minutes. But um, I thank him for coming and sharing those sentiments with us. I also want to thank the whole Lexington Fayette Council. They, um, through the work of our vice mayor, Linda Gordon, they um, uh, donated the money, uh, gave the money for this event to happen this evening. And they also have been very strong supporters of the Carnegie Center in the whole cycle of literacy that we do, including working with children uh, in our after school program. So thank you to the council. And thank you to the Kentucky Arts Council, which has also been a partner of ours during this period. Is Lori Meadows here? There she is, way in the back. I got a tape. Thank you very much. And Lori uh, 
um, actually um, was the chair of the uh, one of our nominating committees and worked with Poets Laureate and writers and bookstore owners and others around the state in order to ensure that we had a statewide perspective in this. And I want to thank her very much for that. Also, I don't know if Roger Leeser is here, but he helped um, with the um, booze that we're going to have later. So uh, is Liquor Barn, uh, is Roger here? The Liquor Barn, no, he was the very helpful. Um, L.V. Harkness um, uh, gave us a plaque that we will unveil afterwards with all of the names. And Morris Bookshop is here. Is um, Wynn Morris here? Where are they? Morris Bookshop has been a very close partner of ours for several years, and um, we love having them here. And they're going to have books for sale in case any of the readings that you hear inspire you to want to go and buy that book real quickly. If you don't want to buy that book real quickly, but you would like to maybe go to the library and pick up a copy of that book, um, that is also a possibility. Anne Hammond is here. She is the um, director of the Lexington Public Library, and she is partnering with us in getting all of the library branches to um, feature these authors over the next year. And also Dr. James Good who's in the back there, and you will have an opportunity to meet him in the far room on the other side. He is from BCTC, and he has a personal collection of Kentucky great writing. Uh, the authors, the books, signed, first edition, many just beautiful copies, and they're all over there. They're opened up, and um, as long as you're very careful with them and wear your white gloves, you, um, and I'm sure I'll be brought white gloves. Um, if not, we have a few, extra uh, a few extras over there. But the idea is um, to um, really get a first a look at those first um, and the, 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 the documents that these people put their actual hands on. And then finally, thank you to Transylvania University, who um, in addition to two of their um, uh, writers, um, or two of their professors being here tonight to read, um, they also allow us to use their place for parking. So um, if any of you get tickets, uh, you can blame it on the transit. <laughs> Okay, and are any of our board members here, the Carnegie Center board members, if you would wave, wave uh, thank you very much for all the support that you give to <laughs> And there's a small circle of us who are on the Hall of Fame Creation Committee, and are they here too? I see at least two, three, four <laughs> members of those. They have spent many, many hours preparing for tonight, and so this is your night as well. Thank you for all of you. Okay, now on to our honorees. The first person, we're gonna go in this order, the first person, uh, and we're gonna do them one at a time because we're suspense storytelling type of people. The first person to enter the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame began his life in slavery. He was born in 1814, just a few miles from this spot, and he spent two decades as a slave before escaping in 1834 to Ohio. There, he educated himself, and by the 1840s, he was a sought-after orator and essayist, active in the abolitionist movement. When the U.S. Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act in 1950, he, his freedom was imperiled again, and he moved to England and stayed there for about four or five years. And while he was there, he wrote Clotel, which is the story of Thomas Jefferson's daughter by one of his slaves. It would, it would be 150 years more before that story would be confirmed by DNA testing. The first inductee into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame is the first African-American novelist and playwright in the United States. Please honor William Wells Brown. <laughs> to read an excerpt from Brown's work this evening, we have the widely published poet, Jeremy Payton. Jeremy grew up in several different countries, and um, he is currently a professor of Spanish at Transylvania University and a member of the Appalachian Poets. Please welcome Dr. Jeremy Payton.
the Clotel is meritorious and should be read. I'm going to read from one of William L. Brown's essays. It comes from a book called The Black Man, His Antecedents, His Genius, and His Achievements, published in 1863. And it's a biography of various prominent persons of African descent, whether Haitian, whether here in the U.S. or in England. This is from Chapter 2. On the 14th of August last, the president intimated that the whites and the blacks could not live together in peace on account of one race being superior intellectually to the other. It does not become the whites to point the finger of scorn at the blacks when they have been so long degrading them. The Negro has not always been considered the inferior race. The time was when he stood at the head of science and literature. The image of the Negro is engraved upon the monuments of Egypt, not as a bondman, but as the master of art. Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, was supposed to have been an African princess. Atlas and even the great Jupiter Amon himself were located by mythologists in Africa. Though there may not be much in these fables, they teach us, nevertheless, who were then considered the nobles of the human race. From whence sprang the Anglo-Saxon? For, mark you, it is he that denies the equality of the Negro. Hume says they were a rude and barbarous people, divided into numerous tribes, dressed in the skins of wild beasts. Such is the first account we have of the Britons. When the Romans invaded that country, they reduced the people to a state of vassalage as degrading as that of slavery in the southern states. This is not very flattering of the president's ancestors, but it is just. Caesar wrote of the Britons, they are the most ignorant people I have ever conquered. <laughs> Cicero advised his friend Atticus not to buy slaves from England as they cannot be taught to read. I am sorry that Mr. Lincoln came from such a low origin, but he is not to blame. I only find fault with him for making mouths at me. Ancestry is something of which the white American should not speak of unless with his lips to the dust. Britain has risen while proud Rome has fallen, and so has Egypt fallen, and her sable sons and daughters have been scattered into nearly every land where the white man has introduced slavery and disgraced the soil with his footprint. But I do not despair. For the Negro has that intellectual genius which God has planted in the mind of man that distinguishes him from the rest of creation and which needs only cultivation to make it bring forth fruit. No nation has ever been found which, by its own unaided efforts, has arisen from barbarism and degradation to civilization and respectability. There is nothing in race or blood, in color or features, that imparts susceptibility of improvement to one race over another. Knowledge is not innate. As the Greeks and Romans and Jews drew knowledge from the Egyptians 3,000 years ago, and the Europeans received it from the Romans, so must the blacks of this land rise in the same way. As one man learns from another, so nation learns from nation. Civilization is handed from one people to another. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Our next inductee was born in 1881 in Perryville, Atoll, yes, thank you. I'm a Yankee. Boyle County, Boyle County, Kentucky, and spent most of her life in Springfield in Washington County. As a young adult, she taught school for a number of years, but then in 1917, she did something remarkable for a woman or for a man of the time. At age 36, she enrolled as a freshman at the University of Chicago to study literature. Ten years later, her first novel, The Time of Man, was published, and it was shortlisted 
for the Pulitzer Prize. A string of other acclaimed novels followed. Critics spoke of her in the same breath as D.H. Lawrence and William Faulkner, and later Robert Penn Warren, another Kentuckian, said he was inspired by the immense dignity with which she imbued her characters. We are fortunate tonight to have the great niece of this inductee and the great, great nephew. The niece is Rebecca Roberts Owens and the nephew, Michael Stacy. Could you raise your hand? There you are. You might, have caught, you might have caught the name Roberts in there, and that's who our second inductee into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame. It's Elizabeth Maddox Roberts. To read an excerpt from Roberts' work, we have Frank X. Walker. Like Roberts, he was born in Boyle County. He studied at the University of Kentucky and at Spalding and is now a UK professor in English and African Studies. He's the author of eight books and the co-founder of the Appalachian Poets. To read from the work of Elizabeth Maddox Roberts, please welcome Frank X. Walker. Maurice Manning is also from uh, Bull County. We almost arm wrestled over reading this one. <laughs> I'm going to read two short poems uh, of hers that make me think about the, the beautiful music she imbues in, in her, her lyrics and, and family. This first one is easy to see. It's called Three Dominican Nuns. One day they came, I heard their feet. They made a tapping on the street. And as they passed before our trees, their shawls blew out in curves like threes and bent again in twos and L's. The wind blew on their rosaries and made them ring like little bells. I think when I, when I read that, I think about the reason I fell in love with poetry as, as a young person. Uh, and it wasn't just the words, it was the music. And I always heard that in her lyrics. This is called The Picnic. They had a picnic in the woods. A mother couldn't go that day. But the twins and brother and I could go. We rode on the wagon full of hay. There were more little girls than 10, I guess. And the boy that is Joby Kirk was there. He found a toad and a Katie did. And a little girl came whose name was Claire. Miss Katie Marie made us play a song called Fare You Well, says Johnny O'Brown. You dance in a ring and sing it through, and then someone kneels down. She kissed us all and Joe B. Kirk, but Joe B. didn't mind a bit. He walked around and swung his arms and seemed to be very glad of it. Then Mr. Jim said he would play, but Miss Marie, she told him then, it's a game for her and little folks, and he could go fish with the men. Mr. Wells was there and he had a rope to tie to a limb and make a swing. And Mrs. Wells, Mr. Wells' wife, gave me a peach and a chicken wing. And I had a little cherry pie and a piece of bread and after we played two other songs, I had some cake, another wing, and some lemonade. <laughs> Thank you. third inductee is probably the most decorated of Kentucky writers. He was born in 1905 in Guthrie, Todd County. He attended Vanderbilt, where he came under the tutelage of some great teachers of literature. And he became involved in two important writing groups of the time, the Fugitives and the Southern <coughs> Agrarians. Among his awards was the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1947 and twice in 1958 and 1979, the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. He was the nation's first poet laureate and was a major force in literary criticism throughout the 20th century. In 1980, he was presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Jimmy Carter. The third inductee into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame is Robert Penn Warren.
to read an excerpt from Warren's work, we have Morris Manning. Morris is a Transylvania professor and author of four books of poetry. His most recent, The Common Man, was a finalist for the 2011 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. Morris has studied at Earlham College, UK, and the University of Alabama. We're happy to have him back at Lexington. Welcome, Morris Manning. could have read from any genre, uh, but I'm partial to the poetry. <laughs> By my count, Warren published 38 books in his lifetime. I'm going to read the final section of what I think is uh, a, an incredible masterpiece of poetry, which Warren published in 1970. The book was called Audubon, A Vision. And uh, this is uh, the final section called Tell Me a Story. Long ago in Kentucky, I, a boy, stood by a dirt road in first dark and heard the great geese hoot northward. I could not see them there being no moon, and the stars sparse. I heard them. I did not know what was happening in my heart. It was the season before the elderberry blooms. Therefore, they were going north. The sound was passing northward. <coughs> Tell me a story. In this century and moment of mania, tell me a story. Make it a story of great distances and starlight. The name of the story will be time, but you must not pronounce its name. Tell me a story of deep delight. Thank you, Morris. Wow. So great to have such passionate readers. The fourth inductee in our freshman class was born in Letcher County in southeastern Kentucky in 1920. Two. And in his early adulthood, he was a country lawyer. He was passionate about the struggles of his fellow citizens in Appalachia. And for that reason, he ran and then eventually won office to the state legislature. But there, he continued to be frustrated. So in the late 1950s, he took to writing. And in 1962, published Night Comes to the Cumberlands a condemnation of the environmental and human exploitation that was going on in Eastern Kentucky. The book brought attention to poverty issues and, create, and, and was credited with making Appalachia a focus for the 1960s war on poverty. The fourth inductee into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame is Harry Caudill. read an excerpt from tonight from Caudill's work, we have Gurney Norman. And Gurney knew Caudill personally, and now Gurney is the director of the UK Creative Writing Program and a former poet laureate of the state. His books include Kinfolks, Divine Rights Trip, and An American Vein, Critical Readings in Appalachian Literature. Please welcome Gurney Norman. Well, it's an honor to um, participate in this program this evening, and it's a special honor to uh, get to um, celebrate Harry Caudill, a good friend of mine, um, former, uh, in addition to his legal work and his literary career, 
uh, for several years, he was a history professor at UK. Um, uh, Harry was 41 years old when Night Comes to the Cumberland was published in 1963, 50 years ago. Um, it was one of the significant books of, of the era and a hugely um, influence, um, a, a huge influence on uh, um, <coughs> national policy. Less well known that, um, is Harry's novel. He wrote two novels. This one is called The Senator from Slaughter County. The senator, uh, the, the hero of the novel, is uh, a kind of a patriarchal figure in this fictional uh, eastern Kentucky county. Um, he um, was a U.S. senator for, I think, about three years in the story. He was appointed to complete someone's term. Um, he didn't hold uh, office in Kentucky, but he was a major political force. He was a patriarch. He was a true wheeler dealer. Um, and uh, Harry makes of him a, a, a great character. So um, here, um, there's a scene where uh, uh, it's very political. And this is a, a scene where the governor of Kentucky is out campaigning for uh, re-election. And this is his speech in front of a big audience of um, Eastern Kentucky folk, um, a lot of miners, and so forth. The governor began with a story that explained why he was a Democrat. My pa was a coal miner, he lied. <laughs> Just like most of you men are or have been. We lived out on a farm and raised everything Pa didn't buy at the commissary. Ma made our clothes at her old sewing machine. We had an old cow named Flossie, and every single year she had a calf and we'd give plenty of milk for the whole family to drink. Then Pa would sell the calf and take the money and buy each one of us youngins a pair of brogan shoes to wear to school in the winter. So things went along, along real good all the time Woodrow Wilson was president. Paul had plenty of work, and we had all we needed to eat, good shoes to wear, and more milk than we could drink. Then the Republicans got into the White House, <laughs> and old Flossie never would let a bull get in 10 feet of her head. <laughs> she went dry and stayed dry. We had to go to school barefooted and drink water. <laughs> The old man lost his job, and I had to run for something to keep the whole family from starving to death. <laughs> that went on until 1933. Hard times on the farm, hard times in the mines, hard times at the dinner table. Then Franklin Delano Roosevelt got elected and was sworn in. Old Flossie changed her mind and took a shine to old Bart Bingham's Jersey Bull. <laughs> She had twin calves and started giving more milk than ever. The Brady family put on shoes again and registered Democratic. And praise God, friends, they are going to stay Democratic. They've had enough of dry cows, bare feet, and empty bellies under Republican presidents. Uh, well, a reference to, um, uh, he's actually campaigning uh, on behalf of another person who's running uh, for office, and now he's bragging on him. Um, no, I'm sorry, he's bragging on, on uh, his opponent. Um, he's a good old man and knows all about the Constitution, but what did the Constitution do for you in the Hoover days? You couldn't eat it when you were hungry or drink it when you were dry or wrap it up when you were cold. And it won't be worth a cobbler's tack to you in the future if you don't have a job and money to buy groceries. The truth is, my friends, the Constitution ain't worth a lead slug if the people who run the country don't have soft hearts. My opponent loves high society in the company of fancy lawyers in striped pants from big offices on Wall Street. 
He gets dressed up in a black suit and shirt and goes to a party somewhere nearly every single night. And he sits there and drinks French wine and eats caviar and talks about the Constitution, the poor old Constitution. While people like you good men and women here today are lucky to have coffee and beans. That's her. expecting that. <laughs> Thank you, Gertie. The fifth inductee into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame was born in 1908 in Monticello, Wayne County. She attended Berea County, uh, Berea College, and the University of uh, Louisville. Sorry, that was almost in my head. Then she worked for two years as a teacher in Pulaski County. Eventually, she moved to Cincinnati, where she published her first novel, Mountain Path, and in 1954, her masterpiece, The Dollmaker, was a finalist for the National Book Award, but lost out to William Faulkner. She never forgave him. <laughs> the Dollmaker was eventually made into a movie with Jane Fonda. It's the story of a poor Kentucky woman who moves with her family um, from the farm to Detroit's industrial center during World War II to help with the war effort and it's considered by many to be an early work of feminist fiction. <coughs> the fifth inductee into the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame is Harriet Simpson Arnault. Tonight, from Arnaud's work, we have Silas House. Silas is the NEH Chair in Appalachian Studies at Berea College and is a writer and environmental activist. He's author of several novels, including Clay's Quilt and Eli the Good. Please welcome Silas House. Well, I'm um, really glad to be an honor to read from Harriet Arnaud. I was raised pretty close to where she was raised. I was raised the next county over from Pulaski County where she taught. And um, I've chosen a passage from the most obvious selection, The Dollmaker, but it's such a masterpiece that I had to read from it. Um, it's, it's an American masterpiece and is a favorite of many uh, contemporary novelists like Joyce Carol Oates and Marilyn Robinson, who's one of my favorites, um, and, and continues to be really influential, a true writer's novel, um, a novelist novel. So here's a little scene from The Dollmaker. Cassie running, looking, sniffing, pointing out the wonders of the place, filled her cupped hands with walnuts, and came running back to Gertie, pleased beyond measure that she, who so seldom had anything, now had something to give. She was looking at her mother when she stumbled and fell, her face striking hard against a washed out walnut root. She sprang up and stood, rubbing her mouth and looking down at the spilled walnuts. Gertie put an arm around her waist. Cassie, honey, learn to look where you're going. Didn't you see that root? You're always falling down. It's my shoes, I reckon, Cassie said, looking fixedly into her mother's eyes so close to her own, then pulling her head away, but staring still. Gertie pulled the laces until the tops of the shoes touched, but still they were loose about Cassie's thin ankles. I'm going to get you some new shoes one of these days, all your own, she said, then added, Sometime along toward spring, it ain't like they was school and you needed pretty shoes. These Odins of Enix can run you through the winter. Cassie wasn't making of shoes. She was crying now. I can see little girls in your eyes, Mom, little bitty girls. They're little Cassies, Gertie said, bending her head to look at a smear of blood on Cassie's teeth so that the little girls went away. She scooped her up on one arm. We'll go down to the spring, honey, and you can rinse that bloodied up mouth in that good, cold spring water. Cassie cuddled against her, one arm about her neck, her cheek on her shoulder, all her child for an instant, 
The other in the red dress was gone. They passed the old log barn, and Gertie lingered a moment to study it. The shake roof was almost gone, but the walls were good and sound, like the hauled-out chestnut log feet troughs. And in two of the mule stalls, under the good part of the roof, there was such a deal of manure. Her eyes on the good manure were warm as they had been on the house. They were going down the weed-choked spring path when faintly, from the head of the creek, they heard two shots, little popping sounds Gertie recognized as Reuben's twenty-two. Maybe your brothers killed us a couple of squirrels, she told Cassie, but Cassie was asking for a dogwood toothbrush. Gertie cut each of them a red-tipped twig from the little tree of Cassie's choice, and they chewed as they went along, savoring the sharp, bitter, clean taste of the wood. Our final inductee is the only one not born in Kentucky, but he, I believe, lived in the state longer than any other. There's a riddle for you. <laughs> His Kentucky home was not county, and he served for decades uh, at the Hindman Settlement School. His most acclaimed book, River of Earth, was published in 1940, but he continued to write plays, essays, children's books, and novels well into his 10th decade of life. His, his, books of, his book of poems, From the Mountain, From the Valley, was published in 2001, which takes us from 1814 to 2001 into the 21st century. And that was the year that he died at the age of 94. The, we are also fortunate today to have the daughter of this inductee here, and that's Teresa Reynolds with her husband, James. The sixth and final inductee in the first year of the Kentucky Writers Hall of Fame is James Still. To read from Still's work tonight, we have George Ella Lyon. George Ella is a prolific writer and teacher, passionate teacher. She went to school at Center College as well as the University of Arkansas and Indiana University, and she writes all kinds of different types of writing, but primarily, I think, for children and young adults. And she knew James Still and is a lover of his work. Please welcome George Ella Lyon. to get to read Mr. Still's work. And I have to say that through the wonders of the Hyman Settlement School and the Appalachian Writers Workshop, uh, which has touched many people here, I know, uh, I got to know Mr. Still. I also got to know Harriet Arno. I washed the dishes with Harriet Arno. Um, so I was too scared to stay much, but she and her husband were having a fight anyway, so I didn't need to. <laughs> um, James Steele was an enigmatic man. He was magical, he was paradoxical, he was extremely funny in a very uh, Stillian way. He was distilled. And, uh, and he, he said something I thought was very um, interesting along that line. He said, I was early described as a hermit but I've always viewed myself as running toward the world, not away from it. So we have this image of him in his house on Dead Mare Branch, and we think of him as uh, living in that cabin, and he did do that, but he went all over the world, and he was extremely uh, urbane and widely published, and so he's a paradox. And uh, when I knew Mr. Still, Still seemed the perfect name for him because he sort of embodied this stillness. But his work is full of motion, 
Uh, it's full of the love of sound and rhythm, and I want to read two poems. This first one is called Dance on Pushback. Pushback is a branch in Knott County. I tried to see if it actually flows into Troublesome Creek, so I Googled it, but it said it gave me a list of accommodations on pushback. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so, uh, there's the name of uh, the person whose house the, the dance is being held at its gate way. Okay, dance on pushback. Rain your sorry nags, boys. Buckle the polished saddle and set black hats a slant the wind down troublesome. There are doings on pushback at Gabe Way's home place, and the door hangs wide, the thumping keg bubbles with gone some plumping in the elderberry patch. The cider brew strains against red cob stoppers, and the punch and floor is mealed for the skip and shuffle, ready for the stamping, waiting for the hopping, the grapevine swing, the old Virginia reeling in the grease lamps fuming and unsteady gleaming. There are jolly fellows headed toward pushback in the valley's brisk breathing, the moon's white bathing, in the whippoorwill's lonesome never answered calling. Gabe Way has six fair young daughters who dance like foxfire in dark thickets, whose feet are nimble, whose bodies are willowy, as smooth as yellow poplars in early bud, and their cheeks are like maple leaves in early autumn, and their breath is sweet as free, fresh mountain tea. Gabe Way has six full blooming daughters with dresses starched as stiff as Galax leaves, awaiting the dancing, awaiting and hoping. Um, that poem was published in Esquire, 1936. And I want to close with a poem, I think, of the singer, the singer and the song. And I think it sends us on in the knowledge that though these writers, whom we honor tonight, have gone on to that great scriptorium, that great library, uh, in the next world, they're still, their voices are still living among us. We breathe their words, we breathe them tonight, and we have, we have taken them in, all of us, in our molecules, and we will go on doing that. So this is called I Shall Go Singing. Until the leaf of my face withers, until my veins are blue as flying geese, and the moss shingles of my voice clatter in winter wind, I shall be young and have my say. I shall have my say and sing my songs. I shall give words to rain and, tones to, and tongues to stones, and the child in me shall speak his turn and the old, old man rattle his bones until my blood purples like castor bean stalks. I shall go singing my words like hawks.